Draco Malfoy, and why in Merlin's name is it always Harry? My Draco will hear about this. Chapter 13. The Horrible Answer to the Mystery. Time crawled along as the champions faced who knew what in the midst of the maze. Driving Draco completely insane with nerves and worry. At least this time he wasn't the only one losing his wits on the stands. Hermione was squeezing his hand so tightly that after a while he lost all feeling in his fingers and Miss Weasley kept nervously checking her watch, mumbling redundant updates to everyone who'd listen. Twenty minutes since the last champion entered the maze. Twenty-four minutes. Thirty-three minutes. Shouldn't be long now. Two times Draco's heart almost stopped when red sparks... Two times Draco's heart almost stopped when red sparks appeared up in the air as a sign that one of the champions was in trouble. The first time it was Delacour, and the second time, much to both Draco and Hermione's shock, Victor. Both champions looked incredibly shaky as the teachers led them out of the maze and back to their families. Draco spent a long time watching the way Victor's mother was stroking calming circles across his back, while their friend stared into space very much out of it. After Victor had forfeited, nothing happened for a very, very long time. Too long for Draco's liking. Only Arya Diggory left now, Weasley muttered after a while, frustration evident in his voice. Shouldn't that speed things up? Not necessarily, Hermione shook her head. If anything, fewer champions to fight whatever creatures they have to face within might slow the process down. And even if only one champion is left, they can still get lost and walk in circles for hours. Not to mention that we have no way of knowing if they are all right, Draco noted, his voice tight. For all we know, they might have been attacked by something and had no chance to send up red sparks for help. Don't say that! Hermione is her fingernails digging into his palm. Draco couldn't help but though, when an entire hour had passed without any sign of either Harry or Diggory, Draco became more and more sure that something must have happened, and the behavior from the staff seemed to confirm his suspicions. At one point, Gargarov suddenly jumped up, his face ghostly, pale, and horror-struck. He hissed something at Dumbledore before taking off and disappearing from sight. He did not return. Soon, Snape appeared at the jury table, demanding to speak to the headmaster. They, too, backed around a corner to talk, and when Dumbledore came back, his face was deadly serious. Draco stared at him, willing him to make an announcement to tell them what was happening, but he just shook his head at Bagman and Maxime and took his seat again. It wasn't until two hours after Harry had first entered the maze that he reappeared. There was a loud noise, and then he was there, right in front of the jury table, lying in the grass, unmoving. He was clutching the Triwizard Cup in one hand and Diggory's arm in the other. They were both lying very still. Too still. Next to him, Hermione gasped, jumping to her feet. Weasley was yelling, but Draco stayed where he was, frozen, knowing immediately that something was wrong. There were voices everywhere. The staff was hurrying over to the two champions, Dumbledore the quickest despite his age, and soon they were standing in their view. What happened? Hermione demanded. Are they all right? Only heads. Then there were screams and cries, and Draco heard words that made his blood run cold. Diggory, stand! Draco felt like he was going to throw up. His head was buzzing, and he was trembling violently as he got to his feet. Harry, he whispered. He couldn't see Harry. Everyone was pressing closer to where they had appeared, blocking him from view, and he wanted to move, wanted to push through until he could make sure that his friend was alive, but Bill stood in his way holding him back with a fur man on his shoulder. You can't go in there now, he told all of them, because both Hermione and Weasley had started to move as well, looking as frantic as he felt. But Harry, they will take care of him. But Draco barely heard him. There was white noise in his ears. He saw Diggory's parents pushing through the crowds, saw McGonagall and Snape trying to gain control of what was threatening to become a mass panic, saw Dumbledore shouting orders at people. And Draco couldn't breathe, because he couldn't see Harry. Hermione was clinging to him, and there were tears running down her cheeks, both from desperation and frustration. Weasley was arguing with his brother, and Miss Weasley was saying something, but Draco couldn't focus on it, couldn't think. He needed to get to Harry. This was torture worse than anything he had ever experienced. Later, Draco did not remember most of what happened in the hours after. 
No one had seemed available to talk to them, and Miss Weasley had asked everyone she could get her hands on about Harry, but no one had had a ready answer for them. They'd ended up going to the hospital wing to demand answers from Madame Pomfrey, who'd seemed shaky but tight-lipped and grew exceedingly exasperated with their questions the longer they bothered her with them. Moody was sleeping in a bed nearby, looking absolutely horrifying, and Draco had no idea how he'd ended up there. Despite his dislike for the teacher, Draco had to admit that anything that could roughen him up like that was terrifying to think about. What had happened tonight? Then, finally, the door opened, revealing Dumbledore, Harry, and Sirius in dog form. The headmaster had his hand on Harry's shoulder, and his friend looked absolutely dreadful. His sickly pale skin was streaked with mud and sweat, and his green eyes were bloodshot and empty. Miss Weasley started towards them, but Dumbledore stopped her, asking them to refrain from questioning Harry. "'What he needs now is sleep, peace, and quiet,' Dumbledore told them. "'If you would like you all to stay with him, you may do so.' Of course they stayed. Madame Pomfrey led Harry to one of the free beds, and they gave him a moment of privacy to change his clothes. Then they gathered around his bed. Draco claimed a chair on his left side, where he could reach out to intertwine their fingers." Harry squeezed back in acknowledgment. I'm all right, he told them, but his words were slow, and he sounded completely wrung out. Just tired. Miss Weasley stood to Harry's right, smoothing his covers with tears in her eyes, but no one spoke until Madame Pomfrey returned and handed Harry a potion for dreamless sleep. He drifted off immediately after he'd drunk it, leaving all of them to stare at his unconscious form in silence. What the bloody hell happened to him? Weasley whispered. I'm sure Dumbledore will let us know in time, Bill said simply. They did find out rather soon. It wasn't even an hour later that yells sounded from the corridors, breaking the oppressive silence among them. They'll wake him if they don't shut up, Miss Weasley hissed indignantly. What are they shouting about? Hermione breathed, gnawing on her lower lip. Nothing else can have happened, can it? Draco noted that Harry moved ever so slightly, and his whole attention was on him immediately. The other boy's eyes opened, and he blinked slowly, blearily staring into the direction of Bill and Miss Weasley. The latter was just getting to her feet, peeking around the privacy screen to investigate. "'That's Fudge's voice,' she whispered. "'And that's Minerva McGonagall's, isn't it? But what are they arguing about?' The voices were getting closer, and soon they were able to pick up words. Regrettable, but all the same, Minerva. You should never have brought it inside the castle. When Dumbledore finds out. Then the door to the hospital wing burst open, revealing the minister and the professor's McGonagall and Snape. Bill pulled back the screens. Harry sat up, reaching out for his glasses. Draco handed them to him. Where's Dumbledore? Fudge demanded, addressing Miss Weasley. He's not here, she returned angrily. This is a hospital wing, minister. Don't you think you'd do better to... But then the door swung open again, revealing the headmaster himself. What has happened? He asked, his sharp blue eyes flitting between Fudge and McGonagall. Why are you disturbing these people? Minerva, I'm surprised at you. I asked you to stand guard over Barty Crouch. Draco had only a moment to be confused over the mention of Crouch's name. Was he alive after all? When McGonagall shrieked, positively trembling with fury, There is no need to stand guard any more, Dumbledore. The minister has seen to that. When we told Mr. Fudge that we caught the Death Eater responsible for tonight's events, Snape explained, his voice low and cold, he seemed to feel his personal safety was in question. He insisted on summoning a Dementor to accompany him to the castle. He brought it up to the office here, Barty Crouch. I told him you would not agree, Dumbledore, Murgonagall interrupted. I told him you would never allow Dementors to set foot inside the castle, but... My dear woman! bellowed Fudge. As Minister for Magic, it is my decision whether I wish to bring protection with me when interviewing a possibly dangerous... But McGonagall did not let him finish. She turned to Dumbledore instead and raised her voice even more to drown out the minister's protests. The moment that... that thing entered the room, it swooped down on Crouch and... and... She did not finish the sentence, but her intention was clear. The Dementor's kiss... Drago let out a shaky breath. He had no idea what was happening and what exactly Barty Crouch had done to cause all of this, but it seemed like he was worse than dead now. By all accounts, he is the loss, Fudge yelled. It seems he has been responsible for several deaths. 
But he cannot now give testimony, Cornelius. Dumbledore pointed out, his voice calm but dangerous. He cannot give evidence about why he killed those people. Why he killed them? Well, that's no mystery, is it? He was a raving lunatic. From what Minerva and Severus have told me, he seems to have thought he was doing it all on you-know-who's instructions. Lord Voldemort was giving him instructions, Cornelius. Dumbledore confirmed and Draco felt cold all over. Those people's deaths were mere byproducts of a plan to restore Voldemort to full strength again. The plan succeeded. Voldemort has been restored to his body. For a moment, there was dead silence. Draco felt like he couldn't breathe. His eyes traveled back to Harry, but the other boy was staring at Fudge, not paying any attention to him. Draco heard the following discussion as if through an underwater barrier. It seemed they were talking about Crouch's son, who had been smuggled out of Azkaban by his parents and had returned to the Dark Lord's side this past year. Together, they'd constructed a plan to capture Harry by turning the Triwizard Cup into a port key to transport him someplace where he was forced to take part in the Dark Lord's rebirth, which had apparently been successful. The Dark Lord was back. Sweet Merlin. Fudge, though, seemed unwilling to take Dumbledore's words at face value. You are prepared to believe, he started, a strange smile on his face, that Lord of Voldemort has returned on the words of a lunatic murderer and a boy who, well, fury broke through Draco's shock and he was ready to shout at the minister himself when Harry said very quietly, You've been reading Rita Skeeter, Mr. Fudge. Everyone whirled around to look at him. Fudge's skin turned an ugly shade of red and angled himself away from Harry towards Dumbledore. So what have I have? He called defiantly. If I have discovered that you've been keeping certain facts about the boy very quiet? A personal mess, eh? And having funny turns out about the place? I assume that you are referring to the pains Harry has been experiencing in his skull. Dumbledore returned his voice cold. You admit that he has been having these pains then? Fudge prodded triumphantly. Headaches? Nightmares? Possibly hallucinations? Listen to me, Cornelius, Dumbledore said, determined and grim. Harry is as sane as you or I. That scar upon his forehead has not addled to his brains. I believe it hurts him when Lord Voldemort is close by, or feeling particularly murderous. Fudge was shaking his head and backing away from Dumbledore. You'll forgive me, Dumbledore, but I've never heard of a curse scar acting as an alarm bell before. Look, I saw Voldemort come back, Harry shouted. He tried to get out of bed, but Miss Weasley pushed him back down. I saw the Death Eaters. I could give you their names. Lucius Malfoy? Draco flinched, turning to face away from Harry. Malfoy was cleared, Fudge called affronted. A very old family. Your best friends with his son. How dare you? Mike Nair, Harry continued. Also cleared. Now working for the Ministry. Avery, Nut, Crab, Goyle? You are merely repeating the names of those who were acquitted of being Death Eaters 13 years ago. Fudge interrupted him. You could have found those names in old reports of trials. For heaven's sake, Dumbledore. He turned back to the headmaster. The boy was full of some crackpot story at the end of last year, too. His tails are getting taller and you're swallowing them. The boy can talk to snakes, Dumbledore, and you still think he's trustworthy. You fool! McGonagall cried. Sutter Diggory? Mr. Crouch? These deaths were not the work of a random lunatic. I see no evidence to the contrary, Fudge shouted. It seems to me that you are all determined to start a panic that will destabilize everything we have worked for these past 13 years. Draco understood then why Fudge was fighting the idea of Voldemort's return so vehemently. He saw it as a threat to his legacy as a politician, as well as his comfortable life and stable position of power. Draco had always known that Fudge was driven... There was a reason he got along as well with his father, after all. But denying danger in the face of facts, that was something else entirely. Dumbledore and Fudge kept arguing, but Draco was unable to focus. The Dark Lord was really back, and his father had been there. What did this mean for him and his mother? Could he even return to the manor this summer? What about Harry? His friend would be in constant danger now. Maybe they should leave the country together. But was there really any place safe when the Dark Lord was back? If your determination to shut your eyes will take you as far as this, Cornelius, Dumbledore said, we have reached 
a parting of ways. You must act as you see fit, and I, I shall act as I see fit. Drago looked up to see Fudge glare at Dumbledore with incredulity and not just a little fear. Now see here, Dumbledore, he said. I've given you free reign always. I've had a lot of respect for you. I might not have agreed with some of your decisions, but I've kept quiet. There aren't many who'd have let you hire werewolves or keep Hagrid or decide what to teach your students without reference to the ministry. But if you're going to work against me... The only one against whom I intend to work is Lord Voldemort. Dumbledore interrupted, his tone polite but firm. If you are against him, then we'd remain, Cornelius, on the same side. There was another tensed silence until Fudge pleaded, the fear finally showing in his voice. He can't be back, Dumbledore. He just can't be. Draco did not expect it when Snape stepped forward. His head of house had kept quiet through most of the exchange, but now he was pulling up the left sleeve of his robes and thrusting his lower arm at Fudge to look at. Draco could not see what he was showing him, but Fudge recoiled visibly. There, he spat. There, the dark mark. It is not as clear as it was an hour or so ago when it burnt black, but you can still see it. Every Death Eater had the sign burnt into him by the Dark Lord. It was a means of distinguishing each other, and his means of summoning us to him. When he touched the mark of any Death Eater, we were to disapparate and apparate instantly to beside. This mark has been going clearer all year. Kargaroff's too. Why do you think Kargaroff fled tonight? We both felt the mark burn. We both knew he had returned. Kargaroff fears the Dark Lord's vengeance. He betrayed too many of his fellow Death Eaters to be sure of a welcome back into the fold. Draco felt like he was going to throw up. Draco had never seen the mark on his father, but he must have it too. He must have felt it tonight and have apparated to the Dark Lord's side, all without thinking of Draco, while knowing beyond the shadow of a doubt that he was placing himself on the opposite side of his son in an upcoming war. Fudge, meanwhile, was backing away from Snape and shaking his head. I don't know what you and your staff are playing at, Dumbledore, he said, but I have heard enough. I have no more to add. I will be in touch with you tomorrow, Dumbledore, to discuss the running of this school. I must return to the Ministry. He made for the door, but then stopped and turned back to draw a bag of gold out of his pocket. He dropped it onto Harry's bedside table. Your winnings, he said shortly. One thousand galleons. There should have been a presentation ceremony, but in the circumstances... With that, he turned and left. The moment the door swung closed behind him, Dumbledore addressed the adults among them, giving orders and dispersing the crowd. Bill left to notify his father, McGonagall to fetch Hagrid and Madame Maxime and bring them to Dumbledore's office, and Madame Pomfrey to take care of Winky the house elf. When they had left, he asked Sirius to reveal himself to Miss Weasley and Snape. Miss Weasley screamed in fear as the dog that had quietly spent the last hour among them turned into the ruffled form of Sirius Black. His cousin was as thin and shabby-looking as when he had last seen him almost exactly a year ago. There was a tense moment in which Dumbledore demanded Snape and Sirius to make peace with each other and forced them to shake hands. Then he sent Sirius off to contact Professor Lupin and a lot of other people Draco didn't know. Harry, though, seemed distressed the moment it became clear that Sirius was to leave. Draco balled his fists and looked at his knees as Sirius directed a few comforting words to his godson. He felt the need to reach out for Harry, but he knew it wasn't Draco's touch his friend was craving right now. After Sirius had left, Dumbledore had one last, more ominous message for Snape that Draco could not quite decipher from the mere words, causing his head of house to take off as well, with Dumbledore following shortly after, ordering Harry to take the rest of his potion. This left only him, Harry, Hermione, Weasley, his mother, and the still unconscious Mad-Eye Moody in the room. The silence between them was loaded, but Miss Weasley took it upon herself to return to Harry's side and reach for the bottle on his bedside table. "'You have a good long sleep,' she said gently. "'Try and think about something else for a while. Think about what you're going to buy with your winnings.' "'I don't want that gold,' Harry replied flatly. "'You have it. Anyone can have it. I shouldn't have won. It should have been Cedric's.' These words seemed to tear something within Harry open, and suddenly he was blinking back tears. Miss Weasley put the bottle back down to pull him into a motherly hug. Draco turned away, his own eyes burning with unshed tears. This was killing him. 
Seeing Harry suffer like this and being unable to do anything for him was the worst. He felt so inadequate and useless. What did it say about him that he could do absolutely nothing to make the boy he loved feel better? A loud slamming noise tore Draco from his thoughts. Hermione had moved past Draco towards the window, and her hands were curved around something, cradling it firmly to her chest. Sorry, she whispered, flushing. Your potion, Harry, Miss Weasley said, and when Draco finally dared to turn back around, Harry had drifted off to sleep. He took a shaky breath and fell back into his chair, burying his face in his hands. I'm so sorry, he whispered to himself, to everyone, and to no one. Why are you apologizing? Weasley asked, his voice rough and raw. He cleared his throat once. My father was there! Draco breathed, hot tears spilling from his eyes and hitting his palms. You knew where he stood, Draco, Hermione said softly. This is different, he insisted. He actually went back! Merlin, what if he uses me to get to Harry? What if being near me puts him in danger? My Weasley sat down in alarm. I'm pretty sure you're in more direct danger with a death eater in your home than Harry is. Ronald, Miss Weasley scolded, and Draco had not even seen her move, but then she was across the room, wrapping him up into her arms the same way she had done to Harry moments ago. Somehow it made Draco cry even harder. Don't you worry, Draco, dear, she said softly. It's going to be okay. You are not alone in this. You have Dumbledore to protect you if necessary, and you can always come to us when things spiral out of control. And I've only met your mother a couple of times, but I'm sure she's not going to let your father drag you into this war. She will do whatever it takes to keep you safe, because that's what a mother does. Draco couldn't form words, couldn't stop his tears, and Miss Weasley continued patting his back and hugging him as if he was one of her own children. The next couple of days were the most depressing ones Draco had ever lived through at this school, and he had experienced the opening of the Chamber of Secrets in his second year. Dumbledore had spoken to the students the morning after the final task, but he had given them very little actual information. The students were still confused and subdued, and rumors spread through the school like wildfire. The atmosphere in the Slytherin quarters was the strangest, though. There was fear tangible in the air, mixed with something completely unexpected. Excitement! Maybe Draco shouldn't have been surprised. The Slytherin housed a lot of Death Eater children like him, and he was the only one who had taken a clear stance against his father's values. Most of the other students stood loyal to their parents, and this new shift was probably something they perceived as a victory. And then there were students like Pansy Parkinson, who were looking at Draco like they were dying to interrogate him for anything that would quench their fear and tell them all the rumors were baseless. Harry was very quiet once he was released from the hospital wing. He did not speak to them about what had happened in that maze, and they did not ask. Instead, they spent all their time together and away from other people, effectively building a wall around themselves that made everyone shy away. Draco knew that some of them believed Skeeter's claim that Harry was dangerous, and for once, it suited them perfectly. The fewer people prying in on their business, the better. The only exception to that rule was Victor, who Hermione had talked to the very next day, and who joined them every once in a while, joining in on their comfortable silence. It was like they were warded off from the rest of the world. Not even not bothered being nasty to him. At the end of year feast, Dumbledore finally revealed the truth about the Dark Lord's return to the rest of the school. Draco was unsure how much weight his words had, though, and he assumed Dumbledore knew that it might be difficult to convince everyone. The Minister of Magic still stood firm in his stands against him, and while Dumbledore might have a good standing with some of the parents, he doubted all of them would take his word over the ministries, and the children usually followed their parents. Leaving Hogwarts this time around was harder than it had ever been. The goodbyes were more heartfelt than usual, as if everyone was afraid to never see each other again. You know you are welcome to Bulgaria any time, Victor told him when he clapped Draco's shoulder. If you need somewhere to go, I am there. Potter too. Thank you, Draco smiled sadly. But I wouldn't want to put you in danger. I'm not exactly the safest person to house at these times. I don't care. Victor told him firmly, You are my friend. If you need me, I am there. Thank you, Draco said again. I'll keep it in mind. 
and I'll let you know how things are going via Owl, I promise. Good, Victor nodded, squeezing his shoulder. The train ride back to London was very subdued, despite Hermione's revelation that she had identified Rita Skeeter as an unregistered animagus in the form of a beetle and captured her, extracting a promise for a one-year silence from her in return for her freedom once they reached London. Trigger was impressed by Hermione's success in actually finding out Skeeter's secret and reminded himself not to get on the wrong side of her ever in his life. Her determination was a fearsome thing to behold. Still, the prospect of what was expecting for him at the end of the ride made him feel like he was the insect trapped in a tiny bowl of less rather than the nasty, bespeckled reporter. Draco's mother was waiting for him at King's Cross when they arrived, and she pulled him into a tight hug the moment she saw him. Draco could tell from the way she held him that she knew. Not that this surprised him exactly. His mother was observant, and this was a big thing for his father to hide. Are we really going back to the manor? He asked, so quietly that only she could hear him. She kissed his cheek and pulled away to meet his eyes. For now, she said softly. Why? he asked. Because we have to give him a chance, darling. He had his chance, he shook his head. Various chances, to be exact, and he's made his choice. You're too young. She sighed. You don't know what it was like, so you wouldn't understand. But please, Draco, trust me. I haven't given up hope yet. You don't need to believe in him. But please believe in me. Of course I do, Draco gave in, frowning. But promise that we'll leave if you are wrong. I promise, she nodded, gently brushing the hair out of his eyes. You need a haircut, darling. I like my hair long. He shrugged, sending her a small smile. She snorted, but stepped back to give him some space. When it was time to say goodbye to Harry for the summer, the other boy hugged him so tightly that it took Trigger's breath away. Please watch out for yourself, Harry whispered. I hate knowing that you're going back to live with him. So do I, Draco admitted. But Mother is there, and she won't let anything happen to me. Write to me at least once a week. Harry told him, I'm serious, I need to know that you are okay. I will, Draco promised, pulling away to smile at him. And the same is true vice versa. I'll go insane if I don't hear from you regularly. Noted. Harry nodded, smiling back. Looks like Hedwig and Aquila will have lots to do this summer. Deal, deal, Draco chuckled. It's only a little over two months. Two months, Harry repeated. It sounds like an eternity. If you get two more, I'll break you out and we'll go to Bulgaria. Draco joked. I know somewhere we can stay. Harry laughed at that and finally let go of him. I'll keep it in mind, he said. 